Ah, if I let myself feel like this now, he thought, I'll be creating an atrocious thought imp that'll drive him from worse to worse. Down with you! Down with you, you living leprosy! I will wash you off if it's in my own blood! Don't you see, Evans? Sam was now murmuring hoarsely. It's a whole stream of life that's got this possessive instinct, this snatching, scrabbling, scraping, ravishing instinct. What Christ has to do is to deny the whole thing, root and branch. And it's no use saying it's for fuller life or more life that he has to do it. It's all poison. It's all one glittering, shining, seething tide of poisonous selfishness. We are all scale, scurf, scab on the same twisting, cresting dragon of the slime. The tide of life itself is evil. That's the great secret of Christ. And what he's aiming at now, the tortured anti-god that he is, is a freezing up of the life stream. Christ doesn't give a damn for morality, Evans. That's not the point with him. He's out for something far greater and deeper. He's out for the beyond life. Do you remember what I said to you on Tor Hill, Evans, about his remain redeeming matter? I didn't realize that how he redeems matter. He does it by freezing the life force in it. He knows what the life force is, and he can track it down. He can find it bubbling and seething and horning and prickling and taking the tormenting and triumphing of every direction. And then he touches it with his cross and freezes it up. Mr. Evans became aware that old Mrs. Robinson, who had been waiting for Sam late at late appearance before going home, had now crept up from his her broom and duster till she was within hearing. The ex servant of the bishop must have caught some word of their discourse, one of those tragic clue words of our human tournaments, such as old women rejoice to lap up as cats lap milk. And she probably thought of the scene at the Arithmetian's tome as a sort of moving picture close-up, which, if she could get a good seat, would it be the same as the theta? I can't help thinking, Mr. Decker, said the Walshman now, that your ideas have changed a good deal since you talked to us that spring day on the tour. It seems to me that then your ideas were more orthodox. I seem to remember you quoting the words of the Mass, Verbum Caro Factum Est. But from what you say now... Yes, 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 I have changed, Mr. Evans, and everything about me has changed, and the whole world has changed. The world can't go on devouring itself, as it's doing now, snatching, biting, stinging, poisoning, ravishing its flesh, and pressing itself with its beautiful breasts. He threw a very queer expression into these last words, the reason of which was obscure to his chief hearer, but from the way her little rat's eyes glittered in the dusky aisle, not so obscure to Mrs. Robinson. Against reality! Mr. Evans found it very difficult to look at this agitated figure on the other side of the tomb of the great tomb lender without a stir in the coils of the nerve snake within him that fed upon such food. You are lucky in one thing, Mr. Decker, he said. I mean in your quiet life at the vicarage with your father. I'm afraid Elfin's feelings were hurt, said Sam, looking up and turning his head towards the door. His eyes fell upon Mrs. Robinson, who was dusting the seat of a perfectly spotless oaken pew and edging nearer and nearer. Hello, Mrs. Robinson, he called out, and his mouth worked convulsively before he could say another word and the irritation of her presence and his desire to get rid of her. "'Will you be wanting me any more, mister?' the old woman responded. "'Because if not, I'll be making me way home.' "'Nothing, nothing, thank you,' he replied, impatiently, and added in the same tone, "'You can go now, Mrs. Robinson.' "'Twas a shame to hear the way they two was talking,' the old lady said to her son when she got home that night. 
I decent eat and talk twere such as never ought to be heard inside of a hospital least still of a church Undecent earthen talk Undecent earthen talk Undecent earthen talk twere such as never ought to be heard inside of a hospital least still a church Mr. Sammy he hurried me out of the door as if I'd catch a palsy by stying a minute in their company. A little Mrs. Doubtfire in there at that time. Boys are very sensitive creatures, Decker, announced Mr. Evans sententiously. When I was young, there was an old man in the Pembrokeshire Hills, where we lived, that I used to watch milking his goats. I used to catch them from him sometimes. He used to get angry with them, and I used to be glad when he got angry with them. But one day he sent me away for throwing stones at them. And do you know, Decker, I wouldn't go home. I stayed out on the hills for a whole summer night. I slept in a gully on a heap of heather, heather. And all that night when I thought of the goats, he stopped them roughly. For he saw that Sam was no longer listening. Sam, indeed, had only heard a small portion of this speech, and that portion not very distinctly. He was keeping his eyes fixed on the retreating form of old Mrs. Robinson, but the eyes of his heart were fixed upon Nell Zoyland. The girl was back again now from the hospital, and established, with Mrs. Pepperd as a nurse for the child, once more at White Lake Cottage. Mr. Evans had done more than blush as he told about the goats. A deep swarthiness had actually mounted on his cheeks, his forehead, his neck. For this story was a sacred story. Led on by the hour and by the place, he had told one of the important stories of his youth. But Sam Decker wasn't interested enough even to know whether he had been speaking of goats or of rabbits or sheep. Mr. Evans's black-coated figure had begun to grow misty and faint for Sam, and Mrs. Robinson, issuing forth from the church door, had become for Sam like some fantastical curlicue on the lettering of a tragic volume. Even a saint cannot bear up always, and at that moment so great was his physical exhaustion that something in him nearly broke down. Mr. Evans little knew how near this student of the fourth gospel, standing over the tomb of the man who buried Jesus, had come to crying out a wild curse upon the divine lover. She's my girl, she's my girl, Sam moaned in his heart. What hast thou given me? What canst thou ever give me in exchange for my girl? I don't like this guy. It sucks. His character doesn't make any sense. But I think he's based on, I mean, at least bi biographically speaking, he's based on John Cowper, Pows, Poise, whatever you pronounce it. When they were all at last out of the church and got home, Sam asleep, Mr. Evans asleep, Mrs. Robinson asleep, but Elfin Cantle still sitting at the window of his stucco tower, there ensured a singular dialogue without words between the red light of the reserved sacrament and the empty sarcophagus of St. Joseph. This was one of those dialogues which it is never fantastical to interpret in human language, because no one can deny that in some language they must be perpetually occurring. Aren't you tired, Red Light, of shining so long without a pause in front of this miracle of the faith? Thus, in a cold, flat, toneless voice, inquired the empty, inquired the empty sarcophagus. Yes, answered the red light. I am very tired. If you could get anyone to move you, said the sarcophagus, you could rest here within me, for I am tired of being empty. And the echo of the clock in St. John's Tower, coming down through the belfry into the church, repeated in a voice faint as the old man's last whisper, Tired. 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 
Tired. Tired. Tired. Tired. Tired. As it echoed the striking of the hour of ten over the roofs of Gladstonebury. Well, that's the end of the chapter of Conspiracy, I believe. Wasn't that what that was? Yeah. Now we begin the next chapter, Anon. The Christening. The Christening. Some coffee. See, I'm not drinking alcohol all the time. It's coffee this time. Tossie Stickles, lusty twin girls, were christened by the vicar of Glastonbury. Bastards though they were. With all due ceremony, and at the regular hour before the, for that ritual, after the children's service, on the day following the Evans's visit to the ruined sheepfold. Immediately after the ceremony, the young mother and her small daughters were established once again under Miss Elizabeth's roof in Benedict Street. Nancy Stickles still continued to come each day to help out, so that Toss was enabled to divide her time between looking after her infants and cooking for the family, which still included, after several battle royales with my lord's sister in Bath, the independent Lady Rachel, who now went regularly to work with Ned Atling in the little office of the weekly Wayfarer. You recall, I believe that's the newspaper of uh, Gladstonebury. And he's, Ned Atling is the editor of it. Deep in Miss Elizabeth's heart was lodged the fixed idea that eventually Mr. Barter would marry Tossie. Okay. And with a view to this natural and ethical contingency, she now had begun encouraging the manager of the municipal factory to pay constant visits to his illegitimate family under her roof, going so far as even to give up her drawing room whenever that gentleman came to his conversations with Tossie. It was one of those fantastic and incredible arrangements that in real life are always occurring, situations which, in premonition, seem absurdly impossible, but which are the only ones that nature, molding the prejudices of men to her own views, takes a humorous pleasure in bringing about. The christening of Nell Zoyland's child was something much less easily dealt with, just as the fate of its mother was in the hands of more eccentric and wayward persons than either Tom Barter or Miss Crow. Will Zoyland had made up his mind that his father, the Marquis, should stand godfather to the little boy, who was to be called Henry after the great man. But the Marquis had a nervous dislike of appearing in public in Glastonbury, a place which he had come heartily to distrust and dislike since he had been mobbed in to the, by the rabble on that eventful pageant day. And so after long discussions and procrastinations, it had been worked out that Nell's child was to be baptized at White Lake Cottage by Matt Decker on the 15th of December. Hearing that Lord P. was coming for this occasion, as well as Dave and Persephone, who were the little Harry's other godparents, what must the good Mrs. Pepper do, who was related to half Glastonbury, but beg from her mistress the privilege of giving a little christening party of her own to celebrate this auspicious day. Thus, the 15th of December that year was to be a lively occasion out of West White Lake, and it was a fortunate occurrence, and a good omen, too, for Babe Harry, that this day, after so much rain, was one of cloudy and intermittent, but still of quite perceptible sunshine. Harry was a tragic little boy in certain ways. He clung desperately to his mother, and it was always touching to see this struggle in his small heart between his intense greediness and his hatred of being fed by any other moose as Mrs. Mr. Evans would have called it, than his mother's lovely breasts. The proletarian contingent of Master Harry's party was to include Mother Ledge and her now quite convalescent niece, Titty Petherton, Nancy Stickles, who was also a relative, Sally Jones, who had once been in service along with Doxy Pippard, the old woman's daughter, and last but not least, our old acquaintance, Mr. Abel Twig, who was Mrs. Pippard's cousin. I hope you're keeping track of all this. There'll be a quiz. 
All these persons were to have their tea in Nell's kitchen, while Lord P., together with Mr. and Mrs. Spear and the vicar, refreshed themselves in her small parlor. Mm. Sounds very nice, doesn't it? Well, until next time, goodbye from... from, uh, where are we? Glastonbury. Cheers.